we are on uh, week two. So this is going to be a session about plotting with ggplot2. Now every session we're going to have some plot that motivates our work together. So we're going to do a plot in, uh, in every session, every week that we do. Uh, so in order to prepare for that, I feel like I really need to get you into ggplot2, one of the main uh, plotting packages for R. Now, uh, there's certainly something called base plots in R. You can make quick and dirty plots, and some people really love base plots, uh, but I'm in camp uh, ggplot2. It's the way I like to plot. It's what I'm going to teach you uh, how to do. So here we are in our roadmap. We're going to do plotting with ggplot2, and uh, next week we're really going to focus on the things that happen before we do our plots, all the importing and transforming of data. I am hoping with a good foundation in ggplot2, we'll be able to do interesting things from week to week, and we'll build you up as we go here. So plotting with ggplot2, uh, and the, the gg in ggplot stands for the grammar of graphics. And I want to explain the idea behind that today, because I think if you get that idea, then the whole package makes more sense when you know uh, what the philosophy is. So we'll show you some core ggplot2 functions. And I, I decided to make it an explicit goal every week to show you a new output format. Last week we did a slide deck. And we're starting with R markdown every time. And we're uh, going to create a new type of output uh, every week. And so this week we're just going to make a, a plain old PDF report that um, you know, if you had the time and the inclination, you could make it as jazzy as you want. You know, if you were working in a uh, uh, an industry setting and you might need to modify the report to make it look like your company's template. And you can do all that once you learn about our markdown templates. We're going to take the a standard approach to a PDF output, but that's our markdown goal for today, uh, spitting out to uh, uh, PDF. So grammar graphics, some core functions in ggplot and outputting to PDF. Our inspiration for today comes from a uh, preprint that I found uh, on the uh, pandemic in uh, China and Italy. And we're going to just look at the uh, China data for today. And we're essentially going to try to reproduce panel B uh, from this plot that uh, you can see it looks like we're actually making three plots in one. So we have these panels within panels. Uh, and often you want to do something like this because your data are complex and it's hard to show in one plot. So what we're going to do is, is teach you how to make a faceted uh, plot like this. So here's what our plot goal looks like today, right? Here's our inspiration. Uh, you can tell uh, once you're used to working in R and ggplot that actually the authors here were also working in R and ggplot. So we're going to try to, we can reproduce it pretty closely, exactly if we wanted to, uh, but I made a few changes. So our plot goal for today uh, uh, does the same layout of the data, right? Does the same scales. Uh, does the same labels on the facets, but adds what I think uh, is a nicer uh, title and a subtitle. And we have a caption down there showing how we got the data. So this is what we're going to try to reproduce for today. The Grammar of Graphics was a book that uh, Leland uh, Wilkinson wrote, I think for first edition came out in 1999. Uh, this grammar of graphics idea. And Hadley Wickham, who is our studio's chief scientist and uh, the uh, developer of the ggplot2 package and many other great packages that you'll know to uh, come to uh, learn and love, he describes the grammar of graphics as uh, a tool that enables us to describe the components of a graphic. So when you come to a plotting task, you know, your first thought won't need to be, um, well, should it be a, a scatter plot or a bar chart? But it'll be, okay, what are the components of the graphic that I want to make? Let me break it down into its uh, constituent pieces. And then it's easier to think through what you need to create. And uh, Thomas Lynn Pedersen has uh, a number of great packages himself in this fantastic workshop. I think it's like a four hour workshop on ggplot2. And he's certainly a, a, a clear expert 
Uh, and you should take a look at the workshop if you really want to take a deep dive into ggplot2. On his GitHub repository, he has uh, the PDF of the, of the uh, when you can see their gorgeous slides and uh, uh, the assignment and links to the YouTube videos. Uh, so you can really take a deep dive with, uh, with, with his workshop. But his slide here really just summarizes uh, the idea of the grammar of graphics, where we have a layered approach. So if you think of every uh, graphic we're going to make as a collection of layers, right, uh, almost like transparencies back when we used to use those, where you, you would have an overhead projector and you would lay down uh, a new transparency for a new slide and you know anything you lay on top of that would be another layer right or if you've worked in uh, Photoshop or GIS programs you're familiar with the idea of, 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 of layers and, and that's what the grammar of graphics is for plotting to say that at the base of our uh, uh, at the base of our plot or data, right? We have some data that we're building on. And like you saw last week, we need to take the data file, let R know about it, and then map it to the X and the Y axis, right? And then we need some geometries to say, well, now that we've mapped it to the axes, what do we actually want to draw, right? Do we want a bar chart or a scatter plot? Um, facets are going to feature uh, pretty prominently today because we're going to take uh, basically one plot and, and split it out and make it into three because that's the best way to present this data. So faceting is like disaggregating the data. You also have a statistics layer because sometimes you need to do something else to your data to make it plottable. Now I'm going to argue that I like to do all that before I come to plotting, uh, but you can do it within the ggplot uh, framework itself. Uh, you'll see that we also can think about the coordinate space. We have X and Y, but we can also rotate and change how our data are presented. And in a, in a coordinate layer, you could think about that. And finally, the theming is where you would go and work on the look, the style of your graphic. It's where I probably spend most of my time, and it's not a great use of time uh, necessarily, but a good, a good theme can turn a, a nice graphic into a great graphic. But the core thing to get right now is that we're going to think about our graphs from now on as uh, a series of layers, right? And we're going to build up our, our layers. So what I want you to do is to go into our studio and uh, the file that you need for today is called uh, week 02. So I'll give you a second to spin that up. When you log in, you should you should see your project from uh, you should see your project from last week. I think Amber uh, kindly shared what she was working on, so you might see Amber's project from last week as well. If you change the setting, you can share your projects with uh, other folks in our workspace. Uh, but you can go ahead and uh, open up, spin up the week zero two, and you know if you missed last week, you're catching up. Our studio cloud is fantastic because it's replicating what you would see on your computer if you were to download this program locally and uh, run it on your own computer. And again, we're doing it in the cloud because uh, I made this project uh, and I know what everybody is looking at on your screen. Right? It standardizes everything. Now, one thing I'd say that I think we learned last week that uh, for a few students, it seemed like as they were running those code chunks, they weren't getting uh, uh, plots to appear right in the window. And if that happens to you uh, today, just go back out uh, by clicking on the uh, title at the top, and then you can jump back into it. And for some reason, uh, that, seems to, that seems to work. Now, uh, perfect. How do you get the layout to look like this? If you go to Tools and you go to Global Options. Now, this is my preference. Um, maybe it'll be your preference too, but at least if you do this, you'll be able to follow along uh, in the same way that I'm doing it. So you go to Tools and Global Options and you go to Pane Layout. And that's where I chose from the drop down to put my source file, that's my markdown file, up in the top left, my console in the top right. And then it doesn't really matter, but I put my history uh, down here and uh, everything else over here. Now, and you, do, you would go ahead and apply or okay that for you. I did ask the folks at our studio, and when I create a project, 
um, it saves the preference for me when I open it back up. My panes are in the right place. But when I create a project, it doesn't, and with certain panes, that doesn't propagate over to your project. Everything else does, but for some reason that setting doesn't. But uh, it's not a high priority for them, but they, they, they do know about it. Uh, so every time we start a new week, if you want to change your pane layout, you'll need to do that. But you don't have to do it every time you open the project. Okay, so what we're going to do is uh, we have our Files tab. And uh, we're going to go ahead and look for the Week 02 RMD, our R Markdown file. So if you go to Files in your File tab, click on Week 02 RMD. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and minimize with this button my history because I don't need the history for anything. Uh, and now I have my week 02 RMD. And I've bumped up the font size on, on my side, so hopefully it's a little bit easier to see on your, on your screen. Okay, so we have our week 2 uh, R Markdown file. And remember, our R Markdown is, uh, starts with our kind of metadata at the top, our uh, YAML heading, Y-A-M-L. And this metadata tells R what kind of document we want to produce and what we want the specifications of that document to be. So you could go ahead and you could put your, uh, your name in between these quotes. You'll learn that um, R is finicky, right? If I didn't add that uh, closing quote, it would give me a problem if I tried to knit it. Uh, so I'll put that quote back on. If I got rid of this uh, colon, it would also, it wouldn't know what to do because it's looking for the metadata to be in a certain format. Uh, you could change the title, of course, if you want. Uh, here's the output piece where we're saying that we want to make something called a book down PDF document too. Um, a book down is a package for making ebooks uh, and websites that look like books. And uh, the reason we're using it is because it makes also nice PDFs that do cross referencing. Uh, so for uh, putting figure captions and figure numbering, it just does it better than the standard PDF report. So that's why we're going to use it. And then within this setting, right, we want to say we're going to make a PDF document. Uh, we're just telling R that we want a table of contents. If we did not want that, you know, we could put false. Uh, but we'll go ahead and keep that at uh, true here. And then I'm going to show you uh, that we're going to incorporate a bibliography today. So we have some references we want to put in our report. Uh, and uh, we want to style to our references, APA style, uh, for instance. So uh, as I go, I'm going to try to keep the focus on ggplot2. But along the way, I'm going to teach you a little bit about our markdown and, and how it all works so that by the end of uh, all of our sessions, Hopefully you'll be great at the data manipulation and you'll have a great sense for how R and R Markdown works. So you remember that this is a code chunk. Anytime that code appears between these three back ticks and then R within the uh, uh, brackets, uh, we're going to load two packages for today, uh, Knitter and Tidyverse. Remember, these are already installed on your computer. You install things once, but you load the package every time that uh, you come to a new project. We can run code uh, a few ways. We could highlight it and go to run, and we could run these selected lines. Or we could choose, since we want to run everything in this chunk, just to go ahead and play that chunk. So now we've loaded our packages. Our packages are ready to go for us uh, for whatever comes next. Uh, Next thing I'm showing you here on the screen is uh, actually a comment in Markdown. Now, a comment in R code, right, and R code is anywhere it's between these chunks, starts with a, a pound sign or a hashtag. Anything after this, R is uh, not going to evaluate, right? It doesn't care what I write after a um, uh, hashtag in a code chunk. But outside of a code chunk, you know, you can see that uh, down here that a, a pound sign actually has a different meaning. Here it's uh, letting me know about a, a level of heading, right? One is one level of heading, that's my top level, um, and uh, second level, third level, and, and so forth. So uh, down in the actual R, R, um, the prose area, uh, pound signs have a different meaning. So the comments here are a little funkier. They start with a less than sign, an exclamation point, and uh, two dashes. And then anything that comes before the next time you have two dashes and uh, greater than sign is code that R is not going to evaluate. So if you wanted to make notes to yourself that were in kind of the text area and not in the code area, uh, this is how you would uh, make a, a comment that R doesn't do anything with. And as we go forward, 
there's some uh, kind of formatting things that I wanted to make a, I wanted my actual document to start on a new page. And what we're incorporating when we kick out to a PDF is uh, an engine called LaTeX in the background. And this is actually a LaTeX command that's telling the document to start on a new page. So not core for what we're doing today, but just so you can understand what you're seeing as we scroll down. Okay, so we're at the start of the report that we want to write for today. We've, we've, we've given it our name, we've given the report a title, and we've made some specifications on what the report should look like. So we're ready to start typing. And uh, this is like writing your first level heading uh, called This Week's Inspiration. And uh, I showed you the plot. It comes from a preprint uh, by uh, Hauser and colleagues. And you can see that uh, preprint here. There's a ton of COVID-related preprint um, on this preprint server right now. Uh, this is their, uh, you can get their data, you can get their uh, code, and you can get their paper uh, from here. And the plot that we're going to try to replicate is uh, figure one, plot B. Now, this is a modeling paper, and it's, it's pretty complex. The code base is uh, certainly advanced. I couldn't get it to run straight out just for me. I think there were some things that uh, they might have to modify. But you could go, you could download their, uh, their data from their repository, right? So we saw a GitHub last week. Uh, so all their data and all their code are stored here. So you could choose to download or clone this to your computer and try to run, uh, or try to replicate uh, their, their analysis. So the, the, the inspiration for us uh, comes from their paper and uh, they're trying to estimate uh, mortality in uh, uh, one province in China and uh, northern, uh, northern Italy. A few things just marked down related as we tick through here, things you haven't seen before. Uh, here I'm doing something that you're probably inferring is a citation of some type, right? Uh, you saw me last week use a few placeholders. Well, here's a placeholder for a citation. And in this format, uh, I'm not looking for it to be put into parentheses, right? I'm looking for it to say, for a preprint by Hauser et al. 2020. That's, that's what this format is doing. And the, the way this connects is we need a uh, uh, bibliography document. There's lots of different ways to do this. I'm just going to show you one. Uh, this, there's this bibliography specified as W2, WK02BIB. And if you go to the, um, your files, uh, you see there's a file called WK02BIB. And when you open that, it's a BibTeX file that specifies the citation details for all the references we want to cite. And the key that we're citing is this Hauser 2020. You can call keys anything, but once you give them a key, that's how you tell our markdown which reference you're actually meaning. And so in here, it has details about the author and the abstract and the year. Uh, and, and here are all the different references we're going to use for today. Right? Here's our book by Wilkinson that I showed you earlier, right? Wilkinson 1999. Well, when I put this in the R markdown, it's a placeholder to say, well, I want you to put the reference information there uh, to cite them. And at the end, I want you to put a reference section. All right, so we can incorporate, uh, we can use this for all of our scientific writing. The other new thing you can see is uh, what looks to be like a footnote, right? In between square brackets and uh, the, uh, is that a carrot? I forget what that's called. Uh, the carrot here, I'm giving it a name. You can call it whatever you want, as long as you call it the same thing when you did, want to define what the footnote is. So here it's like saying, I want to put a footnote right here and here is what I want to put in the footnote, right? And you'll see it at the bottom of our, of our PDF as we go through. So we have some writing, right? Again, we are our markdown. We're combining our we're combining our pros with our analysis, which is what makes it so powerful. Uh, but we've come across our second code chunk, and what it's doing here is uh, we'll go ahead and hit the play button. And you'll see that it should bring in a picture. Right? Not a picture that we've generated from code, but a picture that uh, is in our image directory, the IMG directory. And in our report, we basically want to take this external image and show it in our document. So with these, with these documents, you can 
print graphs that you are creating in R, but you can also bring in uh, outside external images uh, to be able to show. So I'm using this um, include graphics function uh, to bring in uh, uh, this, uh, this file. And I'm just giving it the path to the file. It's in the folder called IMG. So here you see IMG and the name of the file. Okay, so we're bringing in uh, a file because we want to show that in our, in our document. And uh, we're starting a new page. And now I'm moving on to a new top level heading. Uh, I want to talk about where we're going to get the data from. Uh, if it didn't pop up for you, uh, you might try uh, again that trick of going back out by clicking on the title at the top and coming back into the um, into the project. Now, uh, for today's graph example, again, their paper was really complex, uh, a lot of modeling happening, uh, but there's actually a small amount of data just needed to reproduce uh, panel B of of plot one. So I grabbed that data and I've stored it in your project. And if you open the data folder, again, you can use whatever you know directory structure you want. But if you open your uh, in, in files uh, under project here, if you open data, you'll see there are two files. I have it in a wide format and a long format. Now I need you to do something here. I need you to uh, import the wide file. And so the name of it you can see is, uh, is specified here as COVID wide. And <clears throat> I'm giving you the, the text of it up here. Uh, what I want you to do is figure out what would go between these uh, quotes here. We need to tell R uh, where to go find this file. It thinks, and if you're not familiar with the idea of working directories, uh, let me give you a little primer it thinks that this is our working directory. And I can know that by typing get wd, right? A function that tells me get the working directory. And R thinks that this folder called project is like the base of the project, right? So then it can interpret everything from that reference. You can say, go get me something uh, in the image folder. And we did that up here, right? Our path was starting from the root, starting from the base, open up IMG folder, and then you'll find this file called uh, jriou.png, right? And it knows we're here, so just open this, and then inside there, which is kind of what this slash means, inside that folder, you'll find this file. So back down here with the data, we need to tell it um, what uh, folder we need to look in. So over here in our files, uh, what what would be the right folder name to put in here? The data. That's right. So we're going to go ahead and tell it, uh, look in the data folder, data. Uh, and R is not going to be forgiving here. If I did type date, uh, it would tell me that it can't find that file because there's no folder called date. But I can say data, and then uh, this is the name of the file that I want. And R is also case sensitive, right? If I If I called this, uh, wide with a big W, uh, it wouldn't be able to find it because it's not looking for wide with a big W. Uh, you're going to hit a lot of coding errors in the beginning. They never go away really. You just get better at figuring out where your mistakes are. Uh, and in the beginning, it's usually some sort of typing. You've made a typo and R is doing what you tell it to do, not, of course, what you uh, want it to do. So now we're going to use this read CSV function, right? Functions uh, are kind of words followed by parentheses. And we're just telling it, do something. Uh, we want you to read in this CSV file. And I told you last week that this is the assignment operator where it's going to take my data file and it's going to assign that in R's memory to something, an object called DF. You can call it whatever you want. I'm going to call it DF. And if I look in my, if I play that chunk and look in my environment, then I can see here that I have a uh, um, a DF uh, uh, object here. Now I think I've uh, maybe in an earlier version uh, I I meant to call this uh, DF wide actually. So why don't you do that with me? Let's change this instead of being the object DF. Let's make it called the object DF wide. And I could run my selected line. I could run my chunk again. And now I have two data frames over here. I'm not going to worry about 
the df one. The df wide is the one I want. They're exactly the same, but I'm going to reference df wide the rest of the way. And last week we learned we can click on this triangle to open it up to take a peek at there's four variables, right? It tells us that. There's nine observations of these four variables. I can click on the name of the object and it's going to open it up in a uh, viewer. Uh, we can get rid of it if we want. We can say, you know, remove DF, right? It's the one we're not going to use. So if I do that, you'll see it disappears from my uh, environment here. So I can remove it from my, uh, from my workspace. Uh, but here's our data. Uh, again, your Excel fans will, will like to see your data this way, where you can uh, filter, where you can sort, uh, but you can't edit. And that's uh, the idea of reproducibility, that we're only going to edit by typing. We're only going to edit by creating uh, scripts. So we have our data in here now. And uh, we uh, it's in a format, right, that's a wide format. This is a format you're probably very used to using. Um, this is what it would look like if we were in, um, in Excel right now. Right, this is, this is exactly what you were looking at in uh, our studio, where it's in a wide format, where every age category appears once, right? And then we have different uh, values that we want to map to variables that appear in columns. So we have a pop column, uh, cases, and... <coughs> cases and... Uh, uh, deaths, right? So uh, this is a wide format. And if we were trying to reproduce today's inspiration in Excel, uh, you might think of creating three separate charts where you know, the first time you highlight age, class, and pop to create this one, then you highlight age, class, and cases, and then you create another bar chart, and then you do the last one to create this one. And you go in, you fiddle with um, you know, by clicking on the, um, the axes to get it how you want it laid out. You go in and you change the colors to get them how you want. Uh, this is one way to do it in Excel, but it's a lot of work. And if anything changes, uh, you know, it can be uh, hard to go back and get again. So we're going to do this in R. But to do this in R, we need to move away from the, this wide format. Okay. And... Uh, you can go ahead and click play and you're going to see that same graphic pop up that you were just looking at, right? And we're inserting in our report uh, the same explanation of what a wide data frame looks like. And what we're going to do now is we're going to take it into uh, a long format. Now, this specific command uh, and these kind of wrangling functions, we're going to look at in much more detail next week. Um, the point to know now is, and again, I said last time, you have to usually do a bunch of things to your data before they're ready to plot. And one of the core things is usually for ggplot, moving it from a long format, sorry, from a wide format to a long format. So that's what we're gonna do here. Uh, I'm just gonna ask you to play this chunk and not get bogged down in the details that we'll look at next week. Um, and when, you, when you're done, your data should look like this. Uh, in your... Uh, environment, you should now see that we have a DF long in addition to the DF wide. Uh, and here's a snapshot of what it looks like. And the difference here in the long format is now our, uh, our, our, our you know, units of interest, our age categories, they appear multiple times, right? Uh, zero to nine appears for the Chinese population reported cases and reported deaths. And each one of those has a value. Now, we would call this, you can call it a long data set, but it's actually also a, a tidy data frame. And uh, again, Hadley Wickham has a paper on this, and it's, uh, it's the whole philosophy that motivates the, the tidyverse suite of packages, of which GG2, ggplot2 is uh, a member. It's the idea that your data uh, should be in a format where uh, every variable forms a column, every observation is a row, and as we'll see when we get to relational data, that data of different types, uh, different levels, appear in different tables, and you, and you bring them together by joins. So when you put it into this format, and if you want to read more kind of about tidy data, uh, Hadley has a, a paper on that as well. Um, 
but in this format, this long format, and if you want to take a look at it, you can click, click on DF long. So if you didn't, someone's saying that they, they didn't find DF wide, uh, we had to make one uh, coding change, if you remember, uh, back, up, uh, back up here uh, at line 55. I asked you to make this uh, DF wide instead of, uh, um, if you run it again, it should pop up for you. Go ahead and click the, the run button and you'll see it. If not, we'll, we'll try to get you caught up to that. But if you click, uh, if you click run again, it should, it should come in as long as uh, this is correct. This is the other thing to take a peek at to make sure that you're giving it the right uh, file directory and, and name. So now that we have our data in a long kind of tidy format, uh, we're going to be able to plot it pretty easily in ggplot2. So as I mentioned, uh, ggplot2 implements uh, Wilkinson's grammar of, uh, grammar of graphics. And uh, you can go ahead and hit the play button again, and you're going to see uh, or a reminder of these different layers that we're going to look at today. And we're going to step through them one by one, our data, our mapping, our statistics. And you do this for every plot you create. And again, if you get the idea of layers, uh, you'll find plotting becomes uh, much easier. So we'll start with data, right? Every plot begins with data, but like you saw last time, when we have our ggplot function and just tell it um, what our data set is, uh, it doesn't know what else to do with that. So if I click play, it just gives me that blank plot uh, space. Right? I've just told it, I, I, I want you to plot some data, uh, but I haven't told you what to do with it. So what we need to do in the next layer is we need to add some aesthetics. We need to add the, the mappings from our data set, like the columns in our data set. We need to map it to the X and the Y axis, right? And uh, so that's what's going to happen uh, in, in this chunk, where uh, we're taking our ggplot function, and now we're making some aesthetic mappings. Now, I'm also doing a few things in the background, right? What am I doing? Um, I'm starting with my data. We talked about pipes last week, and this um, uh, percent greater than percent can be read as uh, then. So we want to start with our data, then do something, then do something else. So the first thing we're going to do, and we'll talk about this next week, is we're going to filter it. I just want to look at the data about the Chinese population right, the population uh, figures. So just to make it a little bit easier to start with. So we're gonna filter our data, we're gonna start with our long, we're gonna filter our data, and then we're gonna do some plotting. And the dot here tells ggplot, hey, just use what's coming through in the pipeline, right? If I were writing ggplot just on its own, I would say ggplot in the name of my data. But here, because it's part of a pipeline, and that's what I really want you to get to, to be doing, is we're just saying, start with the data, limit the data to just the Chinese population figures, and then in ggplot, use what's coming down the pipeline. And then we have our aesthetics function that says, we want to map the variable age class to the x-axis, and we want to map the values to the y-axis. So in our data set, we have the variable age class, and we have the variable uh, value. Right? And if you want to see what R is actually looking at, I can filter just on the screen this is now what it thinks the data set is when I added that filter step, right? It says, okay, just look at Chinese population and map age class to the X and map the values, which are the proportions uh, to the Y. And uh, the other thing I can do some mapping on is uh, uh, some basics for my plot around a title, uh, a subtitle, a caption, um, and an X and a Y axis label. You see that now that we're in ggplot, um, I'm adding my layers. Uh, this is a mistake you'll make the first couple times, uh, but now when we want to add layers in ggplot, we use plus. We want this plus something else. Then we're going to add something else. You're going to see another plus sign. But previously, we were, we were going to the next thing with the pipe operator to say, and then. It's a little confusing, but the pipe is from our data, and then filter, and then plot. But within the plot, we're adding layers. First layer, and this is all our second layer. Uh, and the last thing you saw last week is this assignment. I want to take all of this, right, 
and I'll just run it in the console so you can see it. It's going to create this empty plot with um, some uh, uh, axis ticks. I want to assign that to P. And I'm going to run that again. And now when I run P, right, it's assigned where that plot just showed up right there again. Because R thinks that um, all of this is what you mean by P. So I can now add my next layer to P in a moment. Okay, so go ahead and run this chunk. And it's going to create an object in your environment called P. And if you wanted, uh, there's a function called class. It'll say, hey, what is P all about? P is a ggplot object. So we've assigned this object to P. Now, you know from our uh, inspiration for today that age is actually on the y-axis. So we have some flipping to do down, uh, down the road. Uh, but right now, we're going to act as if age is on the x-axis and our values are on the y-axis because that's typically how we make plots where we put categories across the bottom and values uh, up the uh, y-axis. So that's what we're going to start with. Then we can add a statistics layer. Uh, sometimes you need to, you know, if you want to add a smoothing line, well, you could do that in ggplot to say that you want to take the, the average and create an average line. Um, personally, I like to do as much of the uh, calculations as possible in the pipeline that leads up to ggplot. So like up in here, uh, I like to do all the calculations and then pass to ggplot the thing that I want to plot. Uh, but you can also uh, do it in a statistics layer. I'm not going to show that today, but there's lots of lots of things you can do to manipulate your data. We're going to get to the fun part where we want to actually now tell our what we want to plot. And this is where the idea of geomes or geometric objects come in. And if you go to this website here, uh, this reference page, you can see that um, there are tons of different types of geomes, a few different ones for bar charts. We're going to make one of those today called a geom uh, call. Uh, you can do heat maps. I mean, there's there's really, I think there's 40 or 50 some of these uh, different geomes, but this is where you start to tell R, I want it to look like a scatter plot, or I want it to look like a, a bar chart. That's what your geome does, right? And we're taking our object, which is stored in P, and now we're adding a new layer, right? ggplot is all about layers. We're adding a new layer, and when we add that layer, you can see that it's it, it started with my background, we had the axis labels and ticks, and now we're telling it, now what I want you to visualize this as are a bunch of bars, okay? And we've limited our data to just the uh, uh, Chinese population. And we could have, in the previous step, uh, said that in the title, uh, but, but I didn't quite yet. But that's where you could have, that's where you could have specified it. So we've added um, uh, geom call to P, but notice we didn't assign it back to P. If I go over to my console and say, hey, remind me R what um, P is, it's going to show you it without the uh, geome because I did not, in front of this, put P as like that, right? That's the only way it gets reassigned. Uh, but right now I'm not, I'm not doing that. So it's just printing it here for me to see, but R still thinks that P is this blank plot. The next layer we can think about uh, deals with our scales. Last week we uh, took a uh, linear scale and we made it exponential. We want to show the uh, increasing uh, number of deaths in an exponential form. Uh, here what we want to do, if we go back to our uh, inspirational plot for today, you can see that the uh, x-axis here uh, goes from 0 to 30, right? 0% to 30%. Ours because R is just trying to take reasonable defaults. It says, well, you don't have data for the Chinese population. No proportions uh, get above about 16 or 17 percent. So R puts a reasonable maximum on that. But if we're trying to reproduce this, we could tell it, uh, well, actually what we want to do is we want to make these uh, ticks uh, percentages, not proportions. So we want to multiply by 100 essentially and put a percent sign. And uh, we want the scale to go from 0 to 0.3 or 30%. And instead of these breaks at 0, 0.05, 0 0.1, we want the breaks to be 
uh, at um, 10%, 20%, 30%. So I'm going to use this funky little uh, sequence function just so you can see what it does. It's saying, I want to make a sequence of numbers from 0 to 0.3 by increments of 0.1. So it's going to do that for me. I could have just typed uh, th all of this with commas in here and said, you know, make these different breaks for me. But I'm telling R uh, to use a function just to pass these along. So when you run this, it's going to re reassign it to P and show it to you. And uh, here now we have uh, our scales that go from 0 to 30, which is great. Um, uh, that's, that's what we're going to need to make it look like our inspirational plot for today. We've turned it from proportions, so 0.1 to 10%, which is also great. And we've put the breaks at the tens, so 0, 10, 20, and 30. Right? And that's all kind of in this scale layer where we're messing around with uh, something about our scales. So we're building, uh, we're, we're building our plot layer by layer. Now what people tend to do first time around is put way too much in one plot. Now I'm going to go back in this example to our original like long data frame. I'm not going to filter just down to the population data because we have data on cases and we have data on deaths that we're trying to visualize too. And uh, I think a bad way to go about this would say, okay, start with your data and make a plot and um, I want you to show me different bars by the variable. And in the variable, if you remember, uh, I'm going to stop filtering, we have uh, population data, case data, and death data. And what this code is saying to R is, um, just give me a different color by the different variable. So when you click play here, um, what it's doing is, it's giving me one of these dodged bar charts. And I've got to look at the um, legend to see that red means Chinese population, uh, the, the population figures, reported cases, and it's really hard to look at a plot like this, I think, and make a whole lot of sense out of it. What we really want to show is, relative to the red, the population, the blue, meaning the cases, are much higher on the older end of the spectrum than at the younger end, right? It's the blues are disproportionate relative to the reds, right? Elderly folks are dying at a higher rate than would be expected. Uh, then they're sort of then they make up of a share of the population, but this plot is not helping us with this. So whenever you find yourself in a situation like this where you just have too much information, this is where you really want the idea of small multiples, right, or facets, and that's what uh, that's what this is doing. It's taking that same data and saying. Let's make one panel where we look at the population data, one panel where we look at the case data, and one panel where we look at the death data. And it makes it very easy to say, here's the population relative to that, um, here are the cases, but then the folks who are dying tend to be on the older end of the age spectrum, right? This plot is a very effective, facets um, or disaggregating the data by this variable are a very effective way of plotting. So we want to be very effective. So we're going to do the exact same thing. Um, uh, this is the, 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 the code we've had before then. We're going to start with our data. We're going to um, make a plot. We're going to pass our data from long. We're going to assign age class to X still, the values to Y. The geome we're going to make are columns. We're going to make bars. We're going to uh, mess with our scales, turning them into percents instead of proportions, and changing the breaks to, be, to go from 0 to 30% um, by breaks of 10. We're going to add a title now. Uh, you know, you can call it whatever you want. I'm saying China's elderly or hardest hit by COVID-19. I'm choosing to add a subtitle. I'm choosing to add a, a caption. Uh, I'm going to label the age group for now, but I'm not going to label Y uh, because Ys are percentages. And uh, it's very clear when you look at the chart that they're percentages, and I don't need to tell you that you're looking at percentages. So as we make like nicer graphs, we don't, we don't necessarily need to label all of our axes. So if someone told you that in the past, um, I'm, I'm telling you from here forward, you do not necessarily need labels on all of your axes. But here's the new piece, right? It ends with a plus. So we're saying, now give me one more layer, add one more layer, and we're going to add something called a facet wrap. 
and we're going to wrap by the variable. And if we look at our data, right, we're wrapping by this variable that says, basically, I want you to make me a new panel that's just for the Chinese population, just for the reported cases, and just for the reported deaths. Right? So I want you to do the same type of plot in each panel, but I want you to break it out into panels according to whatever you find in this variable column. And then it has a parameter called scales and it has a few options. I want you to try it both ways. It's not going to save anything. It's just going to print it for you. I'd like you to try in quotes to say that you want the, um, uh, you want the scales to be free. So you could type in quotes free underscore y. And when you run that, right, so scales equal in quotes free underscore y. And you're going to notice that it's going to scale it's going to scale your axes according to uh, it's going to override your earlier request to go to 30 percent and it's going to scale your axes to whatever makes the most sense based on the panel data so here in the population again the the proportions the percentages never go quite high enough so it does not go up to 30 percent right so the scales can vary between your plots but this isn't really what we want. We want to look at this where everybody has the same scales. So uh, we're going to make this fixed instead. And that happens to be the default, so we don't technically need to type it. But when we do, now you're going to see that the... Um, uh, <coughs> all right, let's see. Um, it... Fix, fix, fixed. Oh, I need to... Sorry, it's not fixed Y. It's just fixed X, it's telling me, it's just fixed. So if I run that again, now my plot looks more like uh, what we're going for. Everybody goes from zero to 30. So in a sort of relative comparison, it makes sense to look across these panels. So when you wrap uh, these facets, you get the choice of what you wanna do with your scales. Uh, and so it depends on your objective, whether it makes sense to do fixed or, or free scales. But now you can see we've added these layers one by one and we're getting a plot that looks like uh, what we want to have. But we need to do one thing for sure. We need to flip, right? We have age on the X, values on the Y, and we know from our inspiration, and certainly the better way to read this is to have your age categories on the Y. Uh, uh, you can see that in the plot we have here that it's really hard to make out these different age categories when uh, <clears throat> there's not very much space for the labels to appear. You have much more room on the y-axis to write out these labels. So let's change our coordinates um, with a coordinate layer. Everything's the same, right? All of this is the same. And uh, here's the new piece. Plus, from where we left off, we're adding a new layer. And we want to use the function to flip the coordinates, chord flip. So when we do that and run this, now it's giving us something that looks very close to the original. Right? We've swapped our axes. So now our percentages are across the bottom. I'm not showing you a label that tells you these are percentages because you're real smart and you don't need me to tell you that. So I've left off the axis label here. Um, I've also left off the axis label on the Y, uh, I think it's clear from the, uh, from the title and the subtitle that you're looking at ages. So to turn the word ages up like this and run it here doesn't seem to make a whole lot of sense to me because I think it's clear from the title and the subtitle. Uh, but we've, we've, we've gotten a lot closer to what we want now because we flipped our axes, right? And we have our nice uh, caption down here at the bottom. If we check in with how we're doing, <coughs> we're pretty close, but the style's uh, a little different, right? We have colors and uh, the plot looks a little bit less complicated here. So remember, when we get to styling, we're talking about our theme layer, right? Here, everything's the same, right? So now, plus our new piece, I'm doing a few things. And you'll learn these as you go and you experiment with what you like in plots. Uh, you can get 95% of the way to where you want to go just by using some built-in themes. 
And if I run just the code here and I don't include the plus, because ours, if I include the plus, R thinks I'm not done talking yet. So I'm not going to include the plus. I'm just going to stop it here and click run. And you can see that the, the plot has changed. It, it's theme minimal. So it looks like more of a minimalist plot. If I go back up, you can see here I have like a gray background and a gray heading over here. Um, and in my new one, when I use the built-in theme minimal, right, it stripped a lot of that away. I do a lot of my plots in theme uh, uh, minimal uh, because that's my preference. But I can further modify things about my theme. Right? I could choose to change the text. Right? I want a different font for my text. And uh, I want to take these headings, these, these uh, facet headings, these strip text here. I want to make them bold. And I want my font, I want my plot title to be bold. And I want my caption to be printed in monospace font instead. And I want it to be a little bit smaller. These are all things that you start to modify with the function theme. And so if you click on theme, right, and you read the help file about it, you're going to realize there's lots, lots, and lots of ways that you can spend a day or two uh, making your plot what you think is perfect. Uh, again, built-in themes will get you very close. And I would say if you're going to make a plot and share it with a colleague, share it with a mentor, just stop with the built-in theme. Like that's good enough to share. Uh, but then when you want to make it ready for publication or external sharing, you might have some more work to do to get it to look just right. So let's come on down here <coughs> to the bottom where we're going to do this. We're going to put it all together and I'm going to click run. I've taken my data. I have my pipeline. Take my data set long and then make a ggplot and just use the data coming down the pipeline. Map uh, age to the x, map value to the y. And I'm going to mess around a little bit with the colors. All right, I want the outline to be black and I want it to be a width just to match our inspiration for today. And I want you to fill the color uh, by that variable. So I want each facet to have a different color. These are the colors I want you to use. We won't worry about this, these specifics today, but basically that's what it's saying. Uh, change the scales for me, right? Move to percents, change the breaks, change the limits. Uh, add some titles, uh, some, some labels to the title, to the subtitle, the caption. Um, I'm going to take away the X and the Y. I don't, I don't think I need labels there. Do the facet wrapping because I want to make three plots, not one. I want to wrap on this variable called variable. Uh, I want to flip the coordinates. I want it to go from being on age from going on the X to the Y. I want to make a minimal theme. I want you to strip away a lot of what's in the background. And I want to mess with the theme a little bit. I want to make it look nicer. Right? And here we go. Right? So a nicer title in bold, a, a nice descriptive subtitle. I don't need axis labels. I've flipped it around. I've made the colors match uh, what our uh, inspiration has for today, right? Um, and then I took a few liberties to make it look how I would have done it uh, if, if I were making this. And at the end, uh, on the new page, I'm having a heading called References where uh, R, when I knit this, is going to take every instance of where I inserted a reference. Let's find one. Here's a reference, Wilkinson 1999. It's going to be in parentheses in the APA format. Um, it's going to look in my bib file. Remember that file? It's going to look for the key for Wilkinson, like, oh, okay, when, when it goes to make a reference, it's going to make it based on this data, right, that I put in the bib file. So now the uh, moment of truth is when we click knit on our files, you can see over here it's running, the stop sign is up, it tells us that it's doing something, I could stop it if I wanted to, but it's in the process of knitting. I'm going to go ahead and tell it to allow a pop-up window because I'm in my browser. And now I have a report, right? I have a table of contents and a title and my name because I asked for all those things. I can click, uh, you know, this, these are sort of built-in hyperlinks. I can click to the different sections. You know, I, I wanted to insert my uh, figure, my external figure, right? So it, I'm showing you some of the code that I used, right? Include graphics, grab that picture, put it there, center it, give it a, um, a caption. Make a new heading. I'll go back up so you can see where we're at here. Um, 
make a new uh, make a new heading for get the data All right so here we are get the data here's my pros here's my code chunk that I wanted to show you where we're getting the data and calling it DF wide right? I'm bringing in the Excel Excel example to show you what a wide format looks like right? here is uh, DF long the object I created my long data set I'm just printing a little bit of it here and so now I have a nice report that you know, it would be easy to share with a colleague. This isn't ready for prime time. This isn't ready to go to a journal, but certainly for your research group, something like this would be more than sufficient uh, along with the, the R Markdown file to let people know what, you're, know what you're working on. And then we get to our uh, final plot here. Oh, I, I skipped over, sorry for the uh, whiplash. Uh, I meant to show you that we have uh, uh, Wilkinson 1999, Wickham 2010, uh, and earlier I had, uh, um, I believe, one where it's formatted without the brackets, so Hauser et al. 2020, uh, and then at the very end, my reference section. So now today we've taken a, a new data set. We've done minimal processing to it to get it into a long file. I explain why uh, that long file is so important because it's tidy. It's a tidy format that is going to be so essential to all the packages in the tidyverse, ggplot2 being one of them. So when you, when you learn about getting your data in the right format, you think tidy and uh, it lets you plot in ggplot quite easily. And ggplot, grammar of graphics, means that we're uh, plotting our layers, right? We're building our layers plus by plus by plus. So we can take from a pipeline from our data and say, and then do this and then do that. And then finally let's plot. And then within our plot, we're adding plus signs. And then here we can, uh, we can make a nice output today being the, uh, the, the PDF output. Um, and <coughs> so I will leave it there today, but I'll stay on to answer questions that folks have. Um, and I will post a, another challenge uh, for for this week. I think what we're going to do is go from plotting uh, uh, bars to plotting lollipops. And uh, it, it is as fun as it sounds. Uh, so thanks for joining. And I'll hang around if folks have uh, some questions.